This is episode 371 of Jumble Think. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to Jumble Think, where we interview dreamers, makers, innovators, and influencers all about their journey of turning dreams and ideas into reality. Along the way, we're going to share some tips on how you can turn your own dreams and ideas into reality, too. On the show today, our guest is Ryan Casey Waller. More about Ryan in a moment. Whether you're a new listener or a longtime fan, if you've never subscribed to Jumble Think, now's the time to do it. Head on over to wherever you listen to podcasts, search for Jumble Think, and click subscribe. To make it even easier, if you head on over to jumblethink.com, you'll find links to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, and more. So head on over, subscribe to the show, and never miss another episode. Now let's join today's conversation. Hey there, friends. Welcome to Jumble Think. My name is Michael Woodward. I am your host We have a killer conversation, a really important topic that we're talking about with our guest, Ryan Casey Waller, in a few moments. But before we do that, we're doing something new. It's a new month, and every month I think I'm going to start doing this. I hope you like it. It is a look back at our last month. I'm going to tell you the top cities and countries that have tuned into the show with the most listens and listeners. If you're in one of these towns, if you're in one of these countries, drop us a little note. Hello at jumblethink.com. Tell us about what you liked about the last month of shows. Tell us your favorite episode. I'd love to hear from you. That's hello at jumblethink.com. Here are our top listening cities and countries in the last month. We're going to kick it out with Sonoma, California, the town of Reinert Park, or right outside of it in California. Thank you so much for tuning in. Seattle, Washington, big listenership there. Thank you so much for tuning in. Lexington, Kentucky, thanks for tuning in. Chico, California, I love Chico. I lived there for several years. Lots of good friends there. Thanks for tuning in to the show. And finally, Brisbane, Australia, a place I'd love to visit. Hopefully, we can meet face-to-face. If you're in one of these cities... Or if you're not, let us know what you loved about the show in January. So honored to have you listening. And there are thousands of other towns and cities and countries across the world that are tuning in to Jumble Think. So if you're listening, you are in good company. So thanks so much for tuning in wherever you're at. But to our top listeners, our top cities, our top countries, thanks so much for tuning in to Jumble Think. It means the world to me that you would listen to our little show here. And I hope it's inspired you to chase those dreams and ideas. That's that's our passion here at Jumble Think. We want to help spark ideas and dreams. We want you to chase those dreams. We believe that you're called and created to do those things. So Thanks for tuning in, and I hope our show has inspired you in some way to chase those dreams and ideas inside of you. On the show today, our guest is Ryan Casey Waller, who's an author, pastor, and licensed psychotherapist with a brand new book out called Depression, Anxiety, and Other Things We Don't Want to Talk About. It's a great book, and what I love most about this book is it's written from the perspective of a psychotherapist who is also an ordained pastor who has personally suffered from depression and anxiety himself. It is an important book for the times that we find ourselves in with so many people at home because of COVID and with the lack of community and support. This book couldn't be more timely. So we're going to be talking about this world of depression and anxiety and much more. It's a really fascinating conversation. So let's go ahead and join today's conversation with Ryan Casey Waller. Hey, Ryan, thanks for joining us on Jumble Think. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. We're, we're talking about your book, Depression, Anxiety, and Other Things We Don't Want to Talk About. We're going to be talking about that world a lot. Before we dive into that, though, I, I want to get a little bit of your backstory. Tell people who you are, how you got to this place where you're kind of uh, becoming a thought leader in the space of, of mental health, especially from the faith perspective and within the church. Well, I appreciate that descriptor as thought leader. I'm not sure about that yet, but thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I, so I'm a licensed psychotherapist here in Dallas, um, but I've had uh, you know a varied career. I'm also an ordained uh, priest in the Episcopal Church, and 
Um, I'm a lawyer. And so I've, I've done a few different things to arrive at this place, but, you know, I'm primarily have entered into the space of talking about mental health within faith communities uh, for two reasons. For one, as uh, when I was working as a, a pastor in a church, I realized that mental health and mental illness not only are highly stigmatized in just like the general culture, but are particularly stigmatized uh, more acutely often in faith communities. And so as a pastor, I, I often found myself with people who were in deep pain, going through difficult life transitions, and I would recommend, hey, have you thought about seeking out a therapist for this? Or like, maybe you've got to uh, help on you know, looking into AA. And I found that oftentimes people met these recommendations with a great deal of resistance. And I began to get really curious as to why. And what I began to uncover is that there is a stigma, particularly in faith communities, because oftentimes we view mental illness as somehow not just a reality that we're having to deal with with our health, but as some kind of faith issue, like a mm. lack of faith, or maybe it's some kind of unconfessed sin. So this, or, or perhaps I feel as though maybe I've not been pious to, to the degree to which I should be. And so people oftentimes keep these issues really, really buried within faith communities because they don't want to be judged in that particular way. So I got really interested in, okay, goodness, how can we integrate psychology and spirituality and normalize these conversations to allow people of faith to feel more comfortable talking about this? And then yeah. secondly, I got really interested because I, I identify very much as, as not just someone who works in this field, but as a co-sufferer. So mm. I'm a person who has battled depression and anxiety for most of my life. And um, so I, I, when appropriate, I, I often want to tell clients, your pain is not just a pain that I'm sort of intellectually curious about, or I've gone to school to learn about, or I've just had the experience of working with other clients, and thus maybe I, I know something I can do in your situation, but that it's, I too have suffered alongside of you. I too continue to suffer alongside of you. And so it's very much a place of two, right? I understand yeah. this kind of pain. And so those are the two primary reasons I've entered into this space. I'm going to normalize the conversation, decrease the stigma, and also, I'm just passionate about this because these are my struggles. Yeah. And I was going to ask you about that. You know, it is one thing to see a need and say, hey, we need to have a conversation about this because of necessity of of uh, whether it's a person that you've encountered. But when it's personal, when it's you that struggled with that, it, it changes the narrative a little bit from the standpoint of experiential. So from that insight, from looking at it from the inside out – how has that helped you in the journey of defining depression and anxiety in yourself and, and help others through this process? Mm -hmm. I think the primary way is that it's really caused me to want to advocate for this publicly Yeah, because in my own depression and in my own struggles with anxiety, I have felt very, very lonely mm. at times. So especially before I came to the conclusion that, hey, I really need to seek out some professional help, um, I, it was like this deep feeling of I'm the only person that's ever felt this bad. Yeah. Uh, I'm the only person that has felt this bad for this long, and that must mean that I'm going to feel this way for the rest of my life. And wow. for a long time, I really came to believe that about myself. And then when I really paired that with, well, I also believe in like, you know, a God who is all loving and cares about us and is with us. And this just this, I guess that means then God made me this way. And this is like my cross to bear. Mm. And so thus I must endure this. And when I finally began to get help for what was going on inside of me, I realized, no, that's not the case. I don't. I'm not the only person that feels this way. I'm especially not the only person who's felt this way for this long. And just because I felt this way today and in the past does not mean this is how I'm going to feel tomorrow. Mm. These are highly chronic and these are highly pervasive issues, depression and anxiety, but they're also highly treatable. And so I discovered that in my own healing. And then also just in the research, I mean, I always want people to know, like according to the American Psychiatric Association, it's about 80% of people who battle depression, once they seek treatment, around 80% of them experience a significant decrease in symptoms. So 
80 percent, right? Eight out of 10 people say like, look, I've had this issue. And when I went and got help, I experienced a serious reduction in these symptoms. So wow. they're, they're treatable. And I always want folks to know that. But I felt so alone. And so, you know, with my own journey, once I began to, to, to find some healing, uh, I, I got to the point where I thought, you know, there, there are only so many people that I can have, you know, one-off conversations with. Um, I thought, you know, it might be worth the time and the effort to sit down and, you know, and put a book together, to bang these words out and put the story together and revisit some of my own personal narrative, but also just take, you know, what I know is out there and try to condense some of these topics down into a single sort of accessible book to hopefully give people an entree into the conversation of normalizing these conversations and to lessen the stigma. So that's how I got here. It was really um, motivated by my own feeling of this is a very, very lonely journey. And so I know beyond a shadow of a doubt because I've experienced it. And also I work with people each and every day who are experiencing it, that one of the main sort of emotions we feel when we're experiencing it is loneliness. Mm. And so I really wanted to speak into this, and not only in book form, but in any opportunity I can to let people know that they're not alone. They're absolutely not alone. They're experiencing something that a lot of us have experienced, and it doesn't have to just be a mark of shame uh, in having experienced that. But the more we talk and the more we share our stories, we can find some camaraderie with one another and share our experience and hopefully you know, encourage each other along in our own paths toward healing. You know, and I, I come from more of a charismatic type environment, uh, and and you know, we talk a lot in those spaces about inner healing. We talk a lot about mm. identity, and yet I think a lot of believers feel like if this is a struggle that they're dealing with, it verges, and and I'm making really broad stroke assessments that are probably not fair, but I, I think a lot of them feel like, <laughs> well, if I'm dealing with depression and anxiety, then I must have sinned. I must have done something wrong. There's something wrong with me. And and you talk about the importance of distinguishing between a clinical diagnosis and your identity mm. as God's beloved. And, and I think that's a powerful thing because, you know, shame binds a lot of people and, and God's desire for us is for freedom freedom from yeah. sin, freedom from brokenness, freedom from the fall, freedom. There are so many different areas and, and for us to find fullness of identity. And, you know, for our show, we talk a lot about dreamers and idea makers. And we always say identity is the, the yeah. foundation of dreaming. If you don't know who you are, you can't have dreams. Your ideas aren't as significant because identity is critical to that journey. So talk to us a little bit about that that distinguishing factor, the the the, the divide, the the real difference between clinical diagnosis and identity? I really appreciate that question. It's central to this conversation. One of the primary reasons I, I think Christians to identify with mental health struggles is this very issue. They think if, if I am a person who struggles with depression, then that means I am a depressive. If, mm -hmm. I, if I struggle with alcohol, then that means my identity is I am an alcoholic. Right. If I have bipolar, that means I am bipolar. And we have this kind of language really interwoven into our lives. You know, we never say to a person that has cancer, you you are cancer. Right. We say, oh, you have cancer. Right. We never say to a person that's a diabetic, you know, um, you 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 are diabetes. We say you you have diabetes. But when it comes to mental illness, we do say these things. We say, I'm bipolar, I'm depressive, right? Instead of I have depression, right? I have anxiety. And so what we get stuck in our heads is these are static states of being mm. that absolutely define who we are. Yeah. When in fact, they are just portions of our stories. They're an aspect to our to our identity. And I'm I'm absolutely not downplaying sometimes really the importance of acknowledging a clinical diagnosis because oftentimes the people who are on the more severe end of the spectrum with the serious mental health diagnoses. Um, you know, part of the difficulty in treating that can be this state of denial that they're in of not being able to recognize that they actually need need the help, need right, the medication, right. need the therapies. That That's a real thing. And I don't want it to minimize that. But what happens is if that becomes the, the centerpiece mm. of, of, of who we are, it can be just crippling 
in terms of our self-worth, what we think we're, we're capable of accomplishing, how it is that we treat ourselves. And so where I get at it, the book is I'm like, look, what I'm, what I'm saying here is not something that I just think is true in the mental health field, but I think this is true in all aspects of our life, which I think is similar to what you're saying. If you're going to dream, you got to know who you are. I said, like, if you want to be healthy, mentally or otherwise, you have to know who you, you are. And the identity as God's beloved child, which is to say that deeper than anything else that's true about you, I know this to be true, that you were made in the image of God. You were brought forth into being because God chose that to be the case. And you are deeply beloved by God. That's an identity that cannot be taken from you. That's an identity that cannot be warped. That's an identity that you cannot disqualify yourself from. And I think that's really, really important with mental illness because what happens in mental illness is that when we are deeply, deeply struggling, most often we cannot see ourselves accurately. It warps our ability to perceive ourselves of having worth and being able to love ourselves, much less receive the love of others. And so this notion, if we can actually take this seriously, that no matter what, we are beloved, God's beloved child, that can just be crucial in the deep, dark valleys of mental illness, or let's say if someone's battling a substance yeah. in those moments of relapse when they just feel absolutely worthless, taking seriously the unconditional love of God can be transformative and oftentimes the very thing, right, that can give hope when there is no other sort of tangible reason to actually have hope. Yeah. You know, I, I worked for years at a church that had a recovery program that was really successful in helping people. And and one of the things that we drove home over and over again was when you follow when you become a follower of Christ and when you find your identity in God, uh, that's where you can begin the journey of true freedom. And I think so often we take symptoms of something and they just become our identity. And when they define us, they become almost uh, something that's embedded that we can't get through. Now, I know depression and anxiety have waves where sometimes it's super hard and you're going through a season that's difficult and there are seasons where everything's going really, really well. And and so it is something that can come back and cycle through. But it seems like there are people, probably more of us that that don't acknowledge this, but we lock into those diagnoses as the identity and then we can't get freedom because that's part of who we are from the standpoint of it defines us instead of it's something that we can we can go through and find the breakthrough through. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, it makes it makes total sense. I mean, we do it in other aspects of our lives, don't we? Yeah. We attach ourselves if you think about it in the reverse, right? So if we if we we for instance, and I, can, I can speak from my perspective. So, so often in my life, I found myself striving, right? Mm-hmm. So like, I really want external validation. So I'm going to go and, and do something because I want the, the pat on the head for it, or I want the, the medal that comes along with it, or, or whatever the reward could be, right. or might be. And what the danger, right, in, in doing that is I'm attaching my identity to what I can accomplish in that very moment. So if I'm succeeding and I'm doing well and I'm hitting those marks that I put out for myself, then I'm, then I'm going to feel really good because, you know, I set out to be, you know, X kind of person. And in this moment, I'm achieving that. And so that's like I can feel good about that. The danger is, though, life is nothing but a series of ups and downs. Yeah. And so some days you're going to have that and other days you aren't going to have that. And so when I fail, when I'm not hitting that mark, then I'm identifying right as a failure. Yeah. And I can't and I can't get beyond that because I'm taking the symptoms of success and I'm attaching that that to my identity. Yeah. Well, then, of course, if we go in the reverse and we say, OK, I've got, you know, um, whatever it might be. So in, so in my case, in my depression, in my anxiety, there have been times in my story where I've abused alcohol. Mm-hmm. And I tell the I tell the story in, in, in the book. I open the book with talking about coming to church and uh, under the influence of, of alcohol, you know, to preach a sermon. And that being this biggest wake up call in my life yeah. that I uh, that I was unhealthy again and that I really needed to take a step back. But in that journey back and I tell the story in the book, I was being questioned by uh, a bishop in my church and, and, and he and he was or asking me to define myself. And I was trying to define myself in terms of my, you know, relationship to God. He's like, no, 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 you know, 
you are you are an alcoholic, right? You are mm. a person who has who has who, who has a problem with chemicals. And while I absolutely didn't was not denying that I had a, a toxic relationship to chemicals, I had also at that point come to an understanding by the time that this conversation had happened that if I identified with my symptoms in these symptoms that are that are my vulnerabilities, that was actually just as potentially damaging yeah. as me identifying my identity with the things that I can naturally succeed at. Both yeah. of them are false. Yeah. Both of them are false. And so I said, no, I can't identify myself with anything, anything at its core other than being a child of God. These other symptoms, if you will, these other roles that I play are simply things that I sometimes do in life and things that I sometimes do not do in life. Yeah. I am not a lawyer. Yeah. I am not a therapist. I am not a writer. I am a person who sometimes writes. I am a person who sometimes engages in the art and the science of psychotherapy. Who I am, I'm a beloved child of God. Mm -hmm. That's who I am. Yeah. And everything can work its way out of that. Yeah. But we do, when we identify ourselves with the symptoms, be it for the positive or the negative, we are running a risk, right? Or actually, I would say we're guaranteeing ourselves that we're not going to be, we're not going to, be able to flourish to the fullness of who we are, because that is a self-limiting belief. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that's really, really a powerful distinction. And, you know, I, I mentioned a few minutes ago that I worked at a church that's more in the charismatic space. And in yeah. doing so, we did a lot of inner healing, prayer work, and and all of the, the things that uh, are on the fringes of counseling, but really aren't counseling. Mm -hmm. So define for us the difference between getting help from a trained counselor or a licensed therapist versus a pastor or maybe some of those prayer ministries. And, and when you need to step from one place of help, maybe your pastor, into a place that's a licensed therapist, and, and when it's healthy just to say, hey, I can just stay in, inside my community and get help mm -hmm. here? Good. Such a good question. Such an important question. So first of all, I am the biggest advocate of prayer. Yeah. I tell people all the time, I, I tell people I pray about my own depression and anxiety every single day. Yeah. And, um, and I believe that we serve a God of all healing and a God for whom there is no malaise, no illness, no problem that is, that is too big. And I also believe that God works in miraculous and often mysterious ways. Yeah. And, and so thus is capable of healing anyone, anywhere, which is probably something that, that I would guess you identify with coming from more of a charismatic oh, background. I mean, I yeah. believe this is true, right? Yeah. I, I think it's tough to be a serious Christian and ignore that truth that you see all throughout scripture. And then if you, you know, if you live your life of faith and around other faith people, there, there are probably things that you've experienced that you simply cannot explain yeah. that are beyond, right. Beyond understanding. Absolutely. And so like, that's true. And I, st and I'll stand by that forever. But I also tell people, Praying is not necessarily a strategy mm. for going about dealing with my mental health. Okay? So, so if we were in a different health situation and you broke your leg and the bone was sticking out, you would, most people, right, 99.9% .9 of the population, they might, you know, obviously like pray <laughs> big time, you know, in, in that moment. Yeah, yeah. But there, there, there would sort of be no question as to whether or not you needed professional help. Yeah, you're right? going to the hospital. Like, <laughs> We're taking you to the hospital yeah. because we, we know that we need that bone yeah. back inside of your leg and yeah. we don't know how to do that. And if we, if we attempt it on our own, we might actually end up killing you. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so just like with the broken leg scenario, oftentimes with mental illness in the faith community, we will take a situation like that, that is just as serious. And we will, we will somehow convince ourselves that we don't need the help of the professionals because the pain is not as visible mm -hmm. because it's more, more psychic. Yeah. And so the question becomes, which is your question. Well, how do we know the difference? This is a difficult question to answer Here's So here's what I, here's what I know. 
when people struggle with their mental health, we know from the data that the first two people they tell, the first two people they're most likely to talk to are their primary care physician and their pastor. Mm. So pastors, if you're listening, here's, here's what you got to know. People who are struggling with this are going to come to your office and they're going to express these pains to you, either explicitly or non-explicitly. It's the duty really of pastors in that moment to be aware enough of mental health and mental illness to understand if they're seeing something that is beyond the scope of their practice. So you're always going to be there. You have your wisdom, all of that. But what we need you to be looking out for are signs of mental distress mm. and your willingness to say, you know what? I'm absolutely want to keep meeting with you. I want to pray for you. I want to encourage you to talk to your group. But I also think that it might sound like you could benefit from talking to a professional. That's all you have to do. Because what pastors, they end up getting themselves into trouble when they start trying to diagnose things that they're not actually trained to do. Yeah. You don't have to go beyond this. Just recommend it. Yeah. Put it in their ear. Let them know that that's okay to do. Yeah. Let them know that they're not somehow turning their back on Jesus or saying prayer's not enough for me. You can model for them that it's just as okay to go see the therapist as it is to go see their um, optotri- uh, you know, uh, ophthalmologist yeah. for, for their eyes or whatever it might be. So normalize it, normalize it, normalize it. The other thing, I mean, what we would say is, you know, the difference between going and, you know, receiving, you know, spiritual care, pastoral care versus, you know, you know, clinical psychotherapy is that the processes are going to be really, really, you know, different. So, I mean, I, I can't get into all of them, but, but I would say, you know, when you go to, to a pastor, more or less, you know, pastors have a lot of duties and a lot of obligations that they have to keep. They, they typically don't have time to sit with the person and do the work of psychotherapy week after week, month after month, because it is a process. Yeah. So what happens when a person avails themselves to doing the work with the therapist is they're committing themselves to a process of self-examination. And sometimes this, these are things that, that, that can, can be taken care of in a few sessions. Sometimes it's something that, that lasts, you know, over a longer period of time, but the thing about it is it is a process. And so it's so it's something that you engage with with the therapist who is trained to not only listen to you, but to help reflect and to direct you right into greater self-awareness around whatever the issue is that you're working on. So it's just a different skill set. And um, and the reality is a lot of people oftentimes don't know if it's clinical or not. And they don't need to try and figure that out on their own. What I always recommend is go ask the professional. Yeah. So in the same way, we, we oftentimes will do this to ourselves. <laughs> like we we decide, oh, we've got to figure this out before I go. Why do we do that? If you've got a if you've got a complex question about your taxes, you don't sit there and think, well, I need to figure this out before I talk to the CPA. Yeah. No, you call you you call the CPA and you say, look, I don't know if I need your help or not. He, here's what I think is going on. You tell me. Yeah. You know. Wh- I try to encourage people just because you, you reach out that one time, that doesn't mean that you're committing yourself to doing it or that you're saying, Oh, I've got this massive problem. You're just availing yourself to get the feedback of a trained professional, take it into them. What's an hour of your time really in the grand scheme of things and tell them, Hey, this is going on. What do you think? Yeah. Therapist, licensed therapists have a duty to only provide care that is necessary and that is in the best interest of the client. Yeah. And so you don't have to like worry, oh, I'm going to go in there. This person's going to just, you know, maybe create a problem for me. So I'll, so I'll come back this, that, and the other. I mean, yes, are there snake oil salesmen and women out there? Yes. But ideally those who are practicing ethically, under, you know, a board aren't going to do that sort of thing. So I always want to, again, just normalize and destigmatize to say, if you're worried about that, or you're wondering whether or not your sadness or your anxiety or your substance use is rising to the level of some clinical disorder, avail yourself, go. And, and the other thing I would say is if you find yourself thinking about this, (laughs) you know, a lot, the odds are (laughs) 
that you would really benefit from talking to someone else about it. Yeah. So go, go, go. Yeah. 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 I chuckled there for a minute because all of us if we're honest, have at some point at 11 o'clock, midnight, 1 a.m., gone, I'm not feeling right, and gone to, w- mm. like, WebMD, and we start <laughs> going down, like, for an hour, we're like, I-, I think I think I'm dying from some kind of rare tumor that only happens in one out of a tr- three trillion people, hasn't been seen right. for 50 years. That's what I have, though. I'm going to go to the doctor. And I, I think exactly right. I think we can really relate to that because not everyone – deals with extreme depression or anxiety. Mm. And uh, so not everyone can, uh, you know, identify with what it's like to be in the darkest, darkest places that some people have gone. You know, I think we all deal with depression at times, but there's, there's a deep, deep depression that uh, I think is even more prevalent now because of COVID that, that a lot of people are just experiencing maybe for the first time or, they may never get it. And it's hard to really empathize or sympathize or, or do that unless you have kind of that picture of it's like trying to self diagnose for what's wrong with your car or what's wrong with your finances or what's, and, and you ask for help there. So why wouldn't you do that here? I, I, I want to pivot and make sure that we're talking a little bit about COVID. Yeah. I, I said early on the pandemic that we had two pandemics going on. I said a pandemic of fear and a pandemic of the disease. And mm. I would really say that, that fear may be a third pandemic, but a, 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 p- a pandemic we're seeing drug addiction rise. We're seeing suicides r- rise. We're seeing all of these different manifestations of poor mental health. And yeah. a lot of that can be in this season, especially for people that haven't gone to that place before, attributed to COVID. What can we be doing in this unique time in history to combat some of these issues when it's such an unknown to everyone. Oh man. Well, it's it's well said. Part of the issue, right, is that what makes a mental health struggle so difficult is that unlike other kind of health problems where so say again to go back to the broken leg issue, if you break your leg, a doctor is going to very very quickly <laughs> be able to to tell you what they need to do to fix it. And we'll be able to give you a decent timeline, you know, for your prognosis. It's going to take, you know, two months, three months, four months till you're back or whatever it might be. With depression and anxiety, if you've never experienced it, what is one of the more difficult aspects to it is not having that, Mm -hmm. of not knowing when it's going to end. And that has primarily been the psychic struggle during covid So people have looked at this and been like, okay, my my world has been upended. What I need someone to do for me is just tell me how long do I have to endure this? Mm -hmm. Give me a timetable. Because if we know what the timetable is, humans can endure almost any kind of pain. Like when you're sitting in that dentist chair and and they're kind of drilling and it's uncomfortable or even painful – you're able to kind of like get through it because you've got this knowledge that in a couple of seconds, you're going to find relief. Now it might come back, but like, if this isn't, it's not going to go on and you know that. Yeah. And you also know that within an hour or two, it's going to be completely over. Yeah. With COVID people are experiencing this existential despair, this loneliness, and there is no definite end in sight. Wow. And it's really, really difficult. And so it's exactly as you say, it is exasperating. People are relapsing all over the place with drugs and alcohol. They're spiraling in deeper into their 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 various mental illnesses, and our, uh, uh, the isolation is is making it worse and worse and worse. So, so what what can we do for for people? Well, one, we can do like what you're doing today, which is to like promote this conversation, saying like this is happening. Let's not ignore it. Let's be mindful. Um, and another big thing we can do is check in on each other. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the isolation here, I mean, we know that human beings are created to form attachments with one another, yes. that we are not designed to, to be alone. And we yeah. know this, like, and we get this like ancient truth right at the beginning of the Bible and God's creating everything and saying the fish are good. The, the earth is good. The animals are good. There's only one thing here that's not good. And that is that the man is alone. Yeah. We were not designed to live alone. And so thus God creates woman, a partner, right? Two people to be together. 
And what we know from attachment theory too is that from the moment you know babies are born, the the outcome of that particular person's life is highly dependent on what kind of attachment is formed to their primary caregiver. Wow. If there's a solid attachment that that is created, we know that that person has a has a much um, higher likelihood of going on to live a you know healthy, right, successful, well adjusted life. Yeah. And so right now. If we are concerned not only for ourselves or we're concerned for other people, we may be cut off from one another physically, but we can be there for one another emotionally. Yeah, We can be there for one another spiritually. We have to lean so hard into that. So an addiction psychiatrist, and I, and I tell this story in the book, who I, he, he sees people who are deep, deep in the throes of addiction, often – oftentimes in life or death situations and was telling me once that even with his most critically ill patients that he says if he can get those people plugged into a community yeah so in other words if if they can get some place where they know people and other people know them he says that half of the battle is won mm. and i was like you you you've got to be kidding me you're a Johns Hopkins trained psychiatrist with every resource right at your fingertips and you're you're telling me that half of the battle here is just people having friends, and he's like, "That's exactly what I'm telling you." Wow, it's exactly what I'm telling you. Wow. So well, well, I know it's it's like shocking, but all the research bears this out too. So we 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 have to. Um, we're in uncertain times. We don't know when this is going to end. We don't know. We don't know. You know what the world is is going to look like when we come up on the other side of it. But what has always been true is still true, is that we need one another, yeah. and so. If you have to, whatever that looks like for you, if that means you've got to join, and I hear people say this all the time, like, I'm, I'm tired, I don't want to do the Zoom thing anymore, you know, I, I'm tired, I want to see, I understand that you might be that you might be tired of it. I understand that it's not the same. I mean, the oxytocin, the chemical that is released in our brain when we're with other human beings that makes us feel good and wants us to have more of that attachment is not released in the same way when we talk to somebody on a screen, yeah. that it's released when we're sitting in the same room. Like, this is all true. But it is better than doing nothing. It is way better than yeah. doing nothing. And so we have to dig deep here, guys. And we have to continue to reach out and to continue to connect with one another. Because ultimately, if we do not do that, right, we're going to spiral. Yeah. And for those who are struggling with depression, if you're listening to this, you probably know that many times in your depression, depression will tell you to do the exact opposite thing of what you really need to do. Right. And for many of us with depression, it tells us to isolate. It tells us, no, 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 no. Don't reach out. Don't text that person. Don't return that phone call. Don't show up for that support group. I mean, just stay exactly where you are. And that'll sound really good. But we know that doing that, isolating, only makes it worse. Yeah. So we've got to reach out. And yeah. we've got to be there for each other. As we wrap up this uh, segment, I I wonder if you could share one or two tips, whether it's to a pastor who shepherds a community, whether it's to a believer who uh, is just a normal Sunday-going church member, whatever that is, what could they do to help shape, maybe not the conversation, but the relationships that they have so that it can be a better support to the people around them mm. who might be struggling with this? Yeah, that's a really good question. I found that most people are sensitive to this once they're they're made aware of it and especially for those who haven't struggled with it they think oh my goodness like I can't imagine feeling that way or feeling that bad and they think I, I want to know what is it that I can do um you know to to help but they find themselves fearful yeah. that if they ask the question if they bring up the topic they're going to find themselves in a situation where they don't know what to say next yeah. they feel like oh my gosh well if i do that if i ask someone i mean are you depressed or if i ask someone are you thinking about hurting yourself what if they say yes mm. what do i what do i do then yeah and some people are afraid too they think well i don't want to plant the idea in their head especially with young people if i ask them if they're if they're thinking about, you know, hurting themselves or, or even killing themselves, well, well, maybe I'm opening that that door up. And so there's all these fears that we have that keep us from asking the question. And here's here's what I want to say to those people: those of us who hurt in this way, 
if you ask us the question, you are not going to put the idea in our head. It's already there. Mm. You are, you are not going to make us hurt worse. Yeah. You're not going to embarrass us. And we are not expecting you to have any answers. If you ask us the question, what is most likely to happen is that we're going to feel really loved and we're going to feel seen mm -hmm. in that moment. Mm -hmm. And we're going to feel like, wow, this person cares enough to hold some space for me. Yeah. And we're going to feel loved. And what you, what you need to know, the person asking the question, is that you don't need to do anything else than ask the question and then be willing to sit and listen with no judgment. Wow. Just receive. Allow the people to be in the same way that Jesus would allow people to be with him. Yeah. Just to, just allow it. And then here's here's the magic thing. All you have to say, even if it's as mild as, yeah, I'm feeling down, or it's as extreme as I feel so hopeless that I want to die. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is, is say this. It sounds like you're in a lot of pain. I can't imagine how painful that must be. You know, there are professionals who are trained to deal with just this kind of pain. I wonder if you should reach out to one of them. Yeah, That's all you have to do. Ask the question, live uh, or listen non-judgmentally, and then recommend. Mm. There are people who are trained to do this. And here's the thing. None of that is complicated or hard to do, except that it does require of one virtue, and that's the virtue of courage. Mm. Yeah, it's a risk. It is scary. Yeah. It's a risk. Yeah. It's worth the risk, and I promise you, I promise you, there are millions of people who desperately need there to be people in their lives who are brave enough to ask the question. Wow. There are so many silent sufferers, and they've been writing me emails ever since this book came out a couple of weeks ago, and they've been signing it, your co-sufferer. Mm. There are lots of us that are out there hurting, and you can make the biggest difference. You could perhaps save a life by simply asking the question and listening. The book is Depression, Anxiety, and Other Things We Don't Want to Talk About. Ryan Waller is the author. Ryan, how can people find this book? How can it connect with you? Sure. Yeah. So the book is available everywhere books are sold. One of the easiest ways to get to a book is to go to you know Amazon.com and you'll find it there. You can find me uh, on Facebook, my full name, Ryan Casey Waller. You can also find me on Instagram, same handle, Ryan Casey Waller. And you can go to the book's website that Thomas Nelson, the publisher, put out, thingswedontwanttotalkabout.com. And there you can find a trailer for the book and you can find a link to all the retailers that are carrying the book. And we're going to do something magical wherever you're listening. All these links are in the episode notes, so all you have to do is click and it will take you right nice. there. So it's going to be easy. We're going to take a break here. When we come back, it's rapid fire questions. We'll be right back. Later this week, we have another incredible guest joining us, recognized as the first artist to have an album debut at number one for both the Billboard 200 and the Gospel charts simultaneously. Rapper and activist Lecrae is one of the most important voices of our time. In addition to earning accolades and multiple Grammy Awards for his musical talent, he has gained international respect for his socially conscious advocacy work, speaking directly to some of the most important conversations facing our nation and the world. He has a new book out called I Am Restored, How I Lost My Religion But Found My Faith. Make sure you tune into that episode later this week. Now let's jump into rapid fire questions. Levez seulement le bras pour mettre l'aiguille sur le disque. Mettez le contact. Reposez votre bras. We are back with Ryan for rapid fire questions. Ryan, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, first question. As a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? A policeman. What is one tip you'd give someone with a big idea or dream and they don't know where to start? Just do something. Do something very small and then do it repeatedly. What's one change you would like to see in the world? Mm, I'd like to see more empathy, more willingness to look at other people and know that they're probably going through a lot that you don't realize. Mm. And um, 
you know, listen to them accordingly. What do you want your legacy to be? Mm, that I showed up for my wife and my kids. Where do you find inspiration? Primarily in literature. Okay. Um, I love to read fiction. Well, with that, what is one book you think every dreamer should read? Oh, what a great question. <laughs> <laughs> One book every dreamer should read. Oh, my gosh. That's stumping me in this moment. Okay, I've got one. Okay. This is, it's, a little, it's a little unorthodox. It's a book of poetry. Okay. And, and it's called Love Poems from God. Uh -huh. And it's a collection of saints, both from the East and from the West. And all the poetry is written in the voice of God. And it, it, is, it is so inspiring because it, the theme over and over again reminds us of something we spoke about early in our conversation is that we were made in the image of God. So yeah. love poems from God. Love that. For you, how do you define success? Mm. I define success as living authentically into the person that God created me to be. What is one trend you are currently excited about? I'm excited about this, this conversation around mental health being destigmatized. What is one habit you find helpful in your life? Sleeping and not, and not, um, <laughs> and not uh, priding myself on being busy, but yeah. taking time to rest. Yeah. Sleep is a magical tool for making life a little bit easier. <laughs> yes, it is. What is one thing you wish you would have known when you first started out? Mm. That people aren't thinking about me nearly as much as I think they are. Mm. If you weren't doing what you're doing today, what do you think you'd be doing? Teaching school. And our final rapid fire question. What is one dream you're still wanting to fulfill in your own life? Oh, I want to become a man that can climb mountains. <laughs> I want to be a mountaineer and I haven't been able to do that yet. Oh, that's awesome. Well, we wish you the best yeah. in that dream. We, uh, I, I thank you so much for going into a conversation that I think it's easier to ignore. Uh, and maybe mm. that's part of what the church has done poorly is ignore it. I don't mm. know, but thank you for being willing to go there, especially in a time in which this conversation is even more significant than it was maybe a few years ago with just everything going on. I, I think, um, bringing awareness, bringing openness, bringing the availability of the information that you share in the book is just really valuable. Mm. Well, thank you for modeling how to do this for, how to, you know, to ask it, to get into it. So thank you. It's, it's people doing what you're doing. That's going to help us destigmatize and encourage people to find the help that they need. And it's so readily available to them. As we wrap up, we always like to leave our guests have the final thought. What would you like to leave everyone listening with today? Hmm. I'd love to leave you with the possibility that tomorrow can be very different than today, especially if you're suffering. Some people have been suffering for so long, they think there's no way that it's ever going to be different. And I want you to know that's the lie that depression loves to tell. Mm. You have no idea how much healing is out there. You have no idea how different tomorrow can be than from today. And if you can't believe that for yourself today, let me believe it for you. Yeah. Ryan, thank you so much for taking time out for sharing about this space and encouraging us to have these dialogues. I'm so thankful for people like you who are taking the risk to do this and bring awareness to a valuable, important conversation that, that needs to be embraced by the church more. So thank you so much. Yes, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. Once again, we want to thank Ryan for taking time out and joining us here on Jumble Think. His new book, Depression, Anxiety, and Other Things We Don't Want to Talk About, is out now. You can find those links in the episode notes. I want to thank you for tuning in to today's show. It means the world to me that you would listen. And I hope wherever you are in life, whether you're going through moments of depression, anxiety, fear, and doubt, or whether you are at a place of just incredible breakthrough in your life, incredible things happening, wherever you are in your life, know that there are other people who love you, who need you, and want to be a part of your life. So take some time today. Spend time with those people, whether it's picking up that phone, just calling them, 
jumping on Zoom, or even that nice face-to-face coffee meeting. Get together with someone. Let them know how much you love them. Let them know what they mean to you. And if you're struggling, share what you're struggling with. Begin the journey of turning your life from a place of despair to a place of hope. We believe in you. We believe that you were created for something awesome, that your dreams, your ideas, that you matter, that the things that are inside of you are significant and the world needs it. So take some time today. Take stock of where you are and begin that journey of chasing those dreams. Thanks again for tuning in. We believe in you. Now it's your turn to get out there, dream big, and change the world around you. Sur les côtés Vous êtes une autre personne Les mères de famille, les enfants Peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant Dans quelques mois, lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique Et que vous serez maître de votre corps Vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.